Please welcome your moderator for things that will blow your mind. Moderated by Accenture's Chief Technology and Innovation Officer, Paul Doherty. Good morning, and thanks for joining us uh, this morning at the Things That'll Blow Your Mind session. We're hoping to, uh, to blow your minds this morning. Uh, as you just heard, I'm the Chief Technology Officer and Chief Innovation Officer of a company called Accenture. And I uh, also just wrote a book called Human Plus Machine, which is looking at the impact of artificial intelligence on our relationships with machines and artificial intelligence and how that's changing our interaction. And in writing the book and in my role at Accenture, I get a chance to, and I'm fortunate to see a lot of cool things, interesting things, very innovative and disruptive things that are happening all around the world. And uh, the things we're going to talk about today, though, I think are taking this to a next level. We're going to really look at some innovators, entrepreneurs who are bringing you know, a really different viewpoint to solving some, some really big problems. And if you think about you know, this event, the Milken, uh, the Milken Global Conference here that we're at, it's a great event. Lots of big ideas tackling the world's big challenges. I'm sure you, many of you have already been at sessions looking at health, impact of healthcare. Uh, what's happening, what the future is, looking at transportation, many, many, many different topics. But, um, you know, if you look at the overall theme this year, navigating a world in transition. You know, navigating a world in transition is what we see as the theme. And I think the biggest transition, or certainly one of the biggest transitions that's happening right now, is the revolution that's happening in technology and science. And it's, it's uh, really a massive revolution. If you think about it, we're in the early stages of this revolution, which is driven by you know, roughly the 70 years that we've had of innovation, starting with uh, silicon and semiconductors, moving on to data, algorithms, artificial intelligence, and everything we're talking about today. And this really is changing the way the world works and lives in a very fundamental way. And if you think about blowing your minds, think about somebody from 100 years ago that showed up here today and the, the kind of experience they would have. It would blow their minds to see what's happening now, to see some of you holding up your phones and taking pictures and talking to our phones and uh, all the kinds of things we take for granted now. And that's what we're gonna talk about today is setting the stage for what's coming next. And it's not 100 years because the pace of technology is accelerating, accelerating fast. So think about you know, even what's happened in the last 10 years. I see a number of you with your, with your phones out there. This is only a little over 10 years old, the smartphone itself. You know, it's something we take for granted now. How many of you check your smartphone as the first thing before you get up in the morning, before your feet hit the floor, last thing before you go to bed? Raise your hands. Yeah, you're, you're, you're not, uh, I'm not sure everybody's owning up to it. 68% of, 68 of you check your phone before, yeah, before you go to bed and before your feet hit the floor in the morning, according to a recent survey. And, and the average person in this room, if the survey is correct, touches your phone uh, 2,617 times a day. So the 2,617, it's about double that if you're a millennial. And the, um, and the uh, impact of this is that this thing is becoming indis indispensable or is indispensable, but I'd argue in the next 10 years, we're gonna, that's not gonna be indispensable anymore. We're gonna move on to even more you know, mind-blowing and disruptive technologies. It'll be about AI-fueled virtual agents that become our friend and teaming partner, helping us in a much less, or much more, uh, you know, much more transparent way, solving our needs. It'll be about new technology. You know, think about maker technology, do it your, the DIY revolution that's happening with 3D printing, nano, nano manufacturing, and things like that. Making things differently. We'll hear about this a little bit today. So what, you know, as an example, in a world where I can 3D print protein that looks like meat, even if I'm a bacon cheeseburger loving person like myself, will it seem foreign and will it be acceptable for us to be eating you know, meat from animals in a, in a number of years. Those are the kinds of questions and opportunities that lie ahead. So we're gonna get on and, and I'm gonna introduce some entrepreneurs to take the stage and talk about some really innovative things that I think are gonna blow all our minds as we look to where the future's headed and uh, really set the stage for some, some big things to come. And uh, I think it was Albert Einstein that said, you can't solve today's problems using the same thinking that created the problems. And I think what we're gonna see is, is uh, people who are thinking differently about problems and thinking about disruption. And disruption is, is um, an overused word right now. We use it every day, but disruption really means a discontinuity, leaving the path you're on linearly and taking a very different approach to a problem. And I think that's what you'll see in common across the panelists today. So let's get into it and bring up, uh, bring up the panelists. And they're gonna come up one by one just to tell you the format. Uh, we're gonna have three, uh, Three really exciting uh, speakers come up and talk about what they're wor working on. They're gonna come up one at a time, do a roughly you know, uh, several minute to 10 minute overview of what they're doing and uh, what the impact it, uh, it's having. 
and uh, then we'll bring everybody up on stage after that, and we'll have a little bit of a Q&A. So let me bring up the first speaker, Dr. Hyunjun Park, who's the co-founder and CEO of Catalog Technologies. Why don't you come on up, Hyunjun? Uh, Hyunjun's leading the effort to address the challenge of data explosion in a very innovative way, using tools from synthetic biology to, to uh, attack and tackle the challenge of, of data. Hyunjun's got a PhD in microbiology from University of Wisconsin, I might add, which is uh, the place I'm from. And his team is committed to encoding all of the world's digital information in DNA, not in silicone. So tell us a little bit more about it. Thank you, Paul, for the introduction. Have the slides. Great. So I'm here to talk to you about storing information using DNA molecules, just as you would use hard drives or a flash drive for. Uh, and I'll get to that in a minute, but I'll first start out with the story. <clears throat> so in the early 1900s, Sergei Prokurin Gorsky, one of the pioneers of color photography, was commissioned by the Tsar Nicholas II to document the Russian Empire in 10,000 color photographs. Over the course of 10 years, he took these beautiful pictures that were preserved on glass plate negatives. Little did he know, these would end up becoming the only records of a world that does not survive the First World War and the Russian Revolution. Now, think of your own photos that you have on your computers or on a cloud server somewhere. Do you believe that because it's digital, it will easily outlast photos that's been preserved on glass plate negatives? So we're, exploding, we're inside of an explosion of data creation. Recent estimates put it at 160 zettabytes by year 2025. That's one six with 22 zeros after it. Now, not all of that has to be stored, but the estimate is that about 40% of it will be potentially critical or more important for enterprise operations. And that's a big problem because by that year, we'll have enough capacity to store about 12.5% of it. That's adding up all the hard drives, flash disks, flash drives, and magnetic tape. So we will generate a lot more useful data than we'll have the ability to store. Now, data is already a core asset of many companies, and that will only become more important in the future. And we've been doing things the same way for too long. The cloud is just someone else's computer taking up acres of land, consuming cities worth of power, and billions of dollars in total cost of ownership. Additionally, it ties the fate of your data with the economical fate as well as the privacy policies of a provider. By, uh, in just a few years, the cloud storage market will be $100 billion per year. But in the next decade, demand will far exceed supply. And that's why we turn to DNA. It's the medium that's been perfected over billions of years of evolution to store nature's most precious information. The stability of the molecule, the chemical stability, means that we can retrieve information stored in it for thousands of years. At 200 petabytes per gram, that's about this much DNA, uh, it's a million times more information dense than flash drives. So think of future data centers that's a million times smaller than they are now. And because we can use enzymes to manipulate the DNA, you can have as many redundancies as you want because it's really easy and cheap to copy the information and distribute it to thousands of different locations. So from these features, the benefit to the user is that we can reliably retrieve information from the medium for centuries, physically own the data, uh, and also reduce the environmental footprint of data storage. Now, it's also interesting to note that uh, as we take privacy and ownership of our data more and more, there is no good solution out there right now for individuals storing thousands of terabytes uh, to physically own that data. But with DNA, that's a pellet that you can barely see. And we're, of course, not the first to think about this idea. As early on as 1964, physicist Mikhail Neiman uh, 
published on the idea of storing di arbitrary digital information on DNA molecules. The first to actually do it was an artist named Joe Davis in 1988, and he was working with a group at Harvard Medical School to encode that uh, message, that small picture, into DNA. And recently, there's been a huge resurgence of interest in the field, partially stemmed by the fact that there's been a precipitous drop of DNA sequencing costs. So in the last 10 years, we've seen a five uh, orders of magnitude improvement in our ability to read back sequences of DNA. So we've seen that kind of improvement in cost before with transistors that largely enabled the world we live in today. Think of what's possible with DNA when the cost is dropping exponentially faster than Moore's Law. Uh, but we're not there yet. In 2016, Microsoft announced the encoding of about 200 megabytes of data in DNA. Yet that came at an estimated cost of about $800,000. So clearly, the synthesis of DNA has been the bottleneck in this technology. So why do we need so much synthesis? It's because scientists have been looking at the way genetic information is stored in DNA, the linear sequence of the base pairs getting transcribed onto the linear sequence of RNA, and then that being translated into protein, and then have been doing it backwards. So if you have the data at the bottom that you want to store, it's a linear sequence of numbers, you define a mapping so that components of DNA represent a few of the numbers, and you synthesize enough of it to represent all the numbers that you want to store. So for example, if you want to store this data at the top, you synthesize the molecule in the middle of the slide. But then again, if you want to store a slightly different string, very similar but slightly different, you start all over again and synthesize a new molecule with just a few base pairs different at the end. And again, slightly different but similar, you start all over again from scratch. So this is kind of similar to hard drives in that the linear sequence of the magnetic polarization, the orientation of them, stores the bit values. But it's very different in that with DNA, it's akin to building a custom hard drive from the ground up each time you want to store something, and the data is hardwired onto the hard drive. So every single time you store something different, you build a new hard drive. So to dramatically bring down the cost, we were on a mission to build the equivalent of a a blank hard drive that we can mass produce using DNA. So to do that, we thought on a higher level, what is information? Information content of a system depends on the entropy, uh, the number of states that it can exist in. And to put simply, to store a lot of information, all you have to be able to do is to make a lot of different molecules. And that doesn't have to come from synthesis. And a cheaper, much easier alternative, for example, would be to build a large quantities of a few molecules, which is a lot cheaper to do, and then attach them together, assemble them together in different combinations to create diversity. And that would be done using an encoding scheme that dictates which of those subsets, which of those combinations encodes what information. And that would be done on demand. And this is our DNA blank hard drive. So simple as that seems, uh, it enables <laughs> <laughs> it enables uh, dramatic cost savings that brings DNA storage uh, to a level that's economically attractive for data storage as early as next year. So as a final exercise, beyond just archival storage, imagine a future where you can carry around all of your health data with you in the form of DNA. All of your MRI, MRI scans, blood tests, allergy information, you'll always have it, you'll never lose it, and you can keep people from getting unauthorized access to it, but it would always be access accessible by your doctor when you visit. Another example, if you needed to distribute physically critical information, news, maybe even blockchain ledger backups to thousands of different locations, DNA would be a great medium to do that with. And each of the decentralized locations would contain the entire information of the, the whole network. 
And then finally, when pioneers begin to colonize new planets, wouldn't we want to send them off with the accumulated knowledge of the human race? You could do that with DNA. Thank you. I'll leave you with that thought. That's awesome. So, so how many of you had thought about DNA as a data storage mechanism before you walked into this room? A few, not too, not, not too many. I, a few toward the front. Uh, but the um, a question for you, because I think those that aren't as steeped in, in DNA and the, and the science around what's happening, you think of, we think of DNA from the stories we read as a very personal thing. Is it you, Hyunjun, walking around <laughs> with the, uh, the world's information encoding in, your, encoding in your DNA? What's the delivery mechanism for this to bring that to life for people? Right. I, no, I get asked that question a lot. Whose DNA are you using? Right. You don't have to worry about a thing because we hire the best interns and <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's a synthetic molecule. So it's, it's, it's a polymer, a biopolymer, having four different components. But you can think of it like plastic, polyesters, polypropylene, very similar, but it's four different molecules. So you can arrange it in different sequences, and that's what's encoding the information. And uh, it's completely biodegradable. It's never been inside of a cell. Uh, it's something we synthesize chemically. Yeah, fantastic. So, and at the very end, it's, it's uh, just a pellet at the bottom of the tube. Great. Well, we'll get into this a little bit more, but thanks for the overview. Very good. And uh, yeah, we'll move on to the next presenter now. So we'll get from DNA into biotech, we're going to stick with the bio theme, theme here, and I'll invite uh, Josh Hoffman to join me on stage. Josh is the CEO of a fascinating company called uh, Zimogen, which is a biotech company focused on delivering better economics from products or for products made from biology that can be used across industries, uh, which is really not doing justice to the <laughs> amazing things that, uh, that Josh will tell you about. Uh, prior to Zimogen, Josh was a partner at Norcob Capital and began his career at McKinsey. So why don't you bring, uh, bring your business to life for us a little bit more? Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for, for giving us the opportunity to talk. Uh, I hope in the next, I don't know, I'm, I've got 12 minutes according to the clock. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you why I, uh, a guy who spent a bunch of years in an investment bank, uh, and spending my time uh, in a in a bio a bio based startup, uh, we actually don't think of ourselves as a biotech. Uh, we think of ourselves as sort of 50% of life sciences and 50% uh, technology. And what I want to talk about is how we're using that combination of machine learning. I don't like the the phrase artificial intelligence. How we're using the combination of machine learning, advanced automation. Uh, and genomics to basically kickstart what we think is a, a materials revolution analogous to uh, the, the petroleum and natural gas revolution that basically uh, created the modern world that we live in today. Um, so let's see if we can get this. I can, pr there we go. All right. So um, the chairs you guys are sitting in, the fabric on those chairs, the, the foam underneath the fabric on the chairs, the glue that wraps around keeps the, the fabric on top of the foam and keeps, your, keeps you from getting that foam on your backside. Uh, the shampoo uh, I use this morning in the shower. The allopurinol that I take every day uh, for gout. Um, the fertilizer. I, I see I'm not the only person that takes that. Uh, the, the fertilizer that the coffee farmer used uh, to keep the yields up in the coffee plantation that made the coffee that I drank after I took the allopurinol uh, this morning and more or less every morning. Um, the phones, uh, the, the case, uh, both the, the hard plastic case but also the soft case that keeps the phone from breaking that I see some of you, uh, you using. What do these things all have in common, right? They all come from, uh, there we go, they all come from petroleum or natural gas. We don't think about this very often. We might be aware of it in some sense, but we live in a world uh, that basically comes from, depends on hydrocarbons. We think about fuel, but we don't think about how much the rest of the physical world, including agriculture and modern medicine, are deeply uh, dependent on hydrocarbons. And there's a, a professor of economic history at Northwestern, a guy named Robert Gordon, who's argued that the, the invention of the chemicals and pharmaceutical industry, and he links them together, that this is one of five great innovations that spearheaded uh, the growth of productivity and human welfare at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, there, most economists would argue, I think, that, uh, that this, this spurt of innovation has created far more 
far greater increase in human welfare than the Silicon Revolution we live through today. So all this comes from petroleum, right? That's, that's a chemical plant. Uh, that's the sort of thing it's made in. And what happens is you take a barrel of oil or a TCF, cubic feet of natural gas, and you crack it. Uh, so you heat it up. I'm simplifying dramatically. You heat it up and it cracks, and it becomes a set of simplified molecules. Think of them as sort of molecular Legos or Tinker Toys that chemists and material scientists can put together to create all those incredible products I talked about uh, a second ago and way more. But we've been doing this for a while, right? We've been doing this for more than 100 years, and the pace of innovation has slowed. Um, so the last major plastic that was introduced in the 60s, was in the 60s, and I don't know, because this is a finance audience, the, <laughs> the multiples on the chemical sector looks pretty different than the multiples on a fast-growing retail or a technology sector. Growth has stalled because product innovation has stalled, and product innovation has stalled because we've squeezed most of the juice out of the lemon. But what if you could do it in a completely different way? So these are pictures of microbes. A microbe uh, is just a little single-cell creature that ingests a carbon source, usually, but not only, always, a kind of sugar. And through its metabolism, uh, the chemistry that happens inside it, it will convert that sugar into some set of, of molecules. And that's the chemical factory of the future. And so what can we do with that? Well, We'll talk about how in a second. So uh, the, the one on the left, apologies, that's, a, that's meant to be a surgical glue. Uh, we couldn't get, good, couldn't get good image of the actual open heart surgery in a way that wasn't going to gross the audience out. But uh, it, it, surgical, surgical if, you're, if you're fixing on the inside of a body, uh, you use sutures or staples. There aren't good adhesives that work in a wet, salty environment, right? The, the thing on the right is the, the case for a, an iPhone. Uh, I think that's a five or a six. But one of the problems with the cases is that as uh, antennas get smaller, uh, and especially as we move to 5G, metal, uh, metal bodies, they're not, they're not what's called radio, radio transparent. So folks are looking for hard, uh, hard cases for phones that are going to be durable, non-scratch, non-breakable, but also allow a, uh, that are radio transparent. So what if we could, let's see if I can get this to work, what if we could make surgical glue that uses the same set of molecules that a, a, a barnacle uses to hook onto a rock or a ship. That's a wet, salty environment. Works really well. Now, it turns out those are big, complicated molecules that are not easy to synthesize. We'll come back to that in a second. But there's no reason why it couldn't happen. What if we could make cell phone cases from the, the kind of mother of pearl ceramic that you see on the inside of abalone? That's an organic material. Again, there's no reason it couldn't happen. The, molecule, the, the material would be great. We don't know, however, enough about how to control the biology. So if we wanted to make this, let's see if I can. So I, I think the one piece I would say is these are real examples. One thing that uh, maybe we'll talk about in the discussion is this stuff is happening now. It's real. We're working with partners on these kinds of products. And we're doing it via the idea of industrial fermentation. Uh, so if you think about it, uh, uh, fermentation, which you're probably familiar to with wine or beer or for some folks, kombucha. Um, you take a feedstock, sugar, right? Uh, grape juice in the case of, of wine. You put a microbe, yeast in the case of wine. It ferments it, right? It spits out ethanol. That's the alcohol. Uh, but it doesn't have to be. And if you can reprogram the microbe so that instead of having it make ethanol, it makes the large-scale proteins that allow the barnacle to bind to a rock, you can create surgical glue. So why hasn't this been done before? Because it turns out that reprogramming DNA to do what we want it to is incredibly, deeply complicated. This, this chart, and I apologize for the numbers, this chart just kind of gives a sense of the complexity. Uh, there are 10 to the 81st atoms in the universe. 10 to the 81st atoms, that's a lot, right? That's more than you need to, to crack blockchain. It's less interesting than the scope of the game space that AlphaGo, the, the Go computer that DeepMind at, at Google did. It's less than the game space that AlphaGo searched. But look at the difference between that and what's required just to look at the gene of a microbe. A gene, by the way, is the collection of base pairs. If you go all the way up to the base pair, the base pairs that Hyungin was talking about, the, the, the GTCs and A's, that's four to the three millionth. These are mind-blowing levels of complexity. 
And they're so complicated that they actually, a human can't understand them. You gotta find some different way of thinking about how to search through this genome to get it to program the microbe to do what we want. And that's what we've done. So rather than have an individual scientist with a hypothesis, an idea of how to do this, uh, and then testing that by hand, what we do is we have robots, the, the robot on the right, doing thousands of experiments in parallel and those experiments are suggested by machine learning algorithms that are helping to search the genome for the changes we want to make. And I'm, I'm trying to be a little bit precise in my language there because what we're not doing is using machine learning to predict the biology. And I'll, I'll try to explain by, by analogy to something that I think folks in the room may know something about, the Yahoo Google uh, story in the early days. In the very early days, mid-90s, Yahoo was a human-mediated view of the web. I was in grad school at the time. I hand-coded a HTML page. I sent it to a librarian at Yahoo. Uh, they probably put it under, you know, sad grad students in Connecticut thinking about life in California. And they, they put it up online. And that human curation of the web worked pretty well when the web was small and not tremendously networked and where there wasn't a lot of ambiguity, right? My, my page was, was, uh, was grad students in Connecticut. Um, wow, it's flashing time. There we go. Um, but it, uh, it, it was only one thing. As the web grew exponentially, humans couldn't keep up. And as the network effect grew, you really couldn't keep up. Larry Page comes along with a very simple idea, which was PageRank. It was a content-free search algorithm. The idea in PageRank, for those that don't know, is a link is a vote. So if you're looking for something, all you're doing is looking, you're going to count the votes, and that's what goes to the top of your search algorithm. Right? And so what we've done is built I mean, I, at the risk of calling the gods of hubris down upon me, I hate comparing myself to Google and their technology, but we've built a content-free search algorithm for the genome. And so these are real things we're working on with partners today. Uh, this is not, this is, uh, this might be science fiction, but it's science fiction of next quarter, not five years from now. We're working with a tier one supplier into the phone business for the screens and coatings to enable a flexible OLED. This is an OLED that you can bend or scroll Stink bugs, I don't know how many people saw, there's a great article in the New Yorker, I don't know, six weeks ago. Stink bugs are this new invasive pest that are starting in the east and moving west, devastating American agriculture. Because of the shape of them, their tiny little feet, as you can see, they don't uh, respond to traditional crop protection agents. We found a protein that, we, that, that is efficacious against stink bugs, and we're working with a major ag company to bring that to market. And lastly, recyclable plastics, but really reusable plastics. So the idea here is, take one of those bottles, when you're done with it, basically put it in a vat of vinegar, I'm simplifying a little bit, heat it up, it melts, then you just separate the two and you can cast it again. Fully reusable plastics. These are all the kinds of innovations that are available when you're able to uh, leverage biology fully. So again, if you think about the history of humankind, right? You got the Stone Age, people beating each other with rocks. Bronze Age, bronze swords, Romans. Iron Age, the Industrial Revolution, people talk about today as the information age. I actually think that's wrong. I think we should think about today, oh, whoops, that went the wrong way. I think we should think about today as the hydrocarbon age, right? That's, that, that defines the world we live in. But what we're trying to do, what we're ushering in is what we think as hopefully as the next age, which is an age of biology. The ability to leverage, uh, leverage nature's diversity, leverage, leverage microbes to create a whole new palette of materials that will change basically everything we touch and feel. Most companies use technology to change the way we talk to each other, or maybe the way we talk about stuff. Maybe they use technology to change the way we manufacture stuff. We're using technology to change the stuff itself. Thank you. That's great. You, you made a great case for the age of biology. That was, was a really fantastic uh, talk, and I love the science fiction for the next quarter. Yeah. Line. That I, I have a board. <laughs> they ask about the next quarter. Do you need the next quarter? But I guess that's maybe just a question for you in terms of where we are with the, with age of biology versus you know, the petro, petrochemical kind of way we think about and really mass produce a lot of things today. Where are we in, in that journey and how fast do you think we're going to disrupt more of those other categories? I mean, to be clear, we have, we will have product in the market at scale uh, in 2020 and maybe in 2019. I think the thing, and this is now a bit of how we think about it as a business, uh, if, we th if you think about replacing petroleum purely as an environmental or social mission, it's pretty hard, right? The stuff that petroleum does, it does really well, right? We think about uh, how can we create materials, molecules that have functional characteristics that have economic value today that petroleum can't provide. That OLED screen 
you could synthesize the molecules we're working with, but it would be a million dollars a kilogram, right? And so we think this is, you know, this is a normal product roadmap that's going to hit markets now. Right, so it's happening. It's happening. All right, good. We'll pick that up again in the panel in, in a minute, too. Let's move on now to, uh, to invite uh, Dr. Vivian Ming uh, up on stage to join us. Vivian was named one of 10 women to watch in tech by Inc. Magazine. Uh, she's a theoretical neuroscientist, entrepreneur, and author, and a good friend. Uh, she founded a number of companies, including Socos Labs, and um, in her free time, invented AI systems to help treat your diabetic son and to reunite orphan refugees with extended family members using artificial intelligence and many other things. And I think you're going to talk to us today about cognitive neuroprosthetics. Is that right? Uh, that's the idea. I okay. could get up here and we could talk about deep quantum fuzzy blockchain. Uh, but I think you probably have heard enough bullshit already. So, sounds like a Dilbert cartoon. Uh, so we'll yes. stick with the, uh, the first topic. <laughs> Um, uh, so let's keep the theme going. We've been talking about how to merge together. No pretty pictures. Uh, I like the flexibility of actually having a conversation with my audience. Um, but we're talking about the merging of information and biology. And of course, I mean, I, everyone should have raised their hands when asked about storing data in DNA, because that's what all of you are. Uh, and that's what you do when you have kids is you mash up some fascinating information about you and a spouse, uh, and then hopefully you don't regret that for the rest of your life. So, um, I am a professional mad scientist. It is the coolest job in the world. Uh, I've been able to trick a lot of venture capitalists into thinking I'm an entrepreneur, but really I take their money and I run experiments. Uh, and it turns out as long as I pay them all back, they never, they keep falling for it over and over again. Um, so, the technology I want to talk about today, uh, you know, I often describe myself as I want to build better people. And it's intentionally a bit of a provocative way of putting the work that I do, which is in education, it's in the future of work, we look at inclusion, we look at mental health, uh, all of these areas. Every human life has a value. How do we add into it so that we gain more back? Um, and so it's very philanthropic work for the most part. Uh, but I have one area of work where when I say I want to build a better person, I literally mean it. Uh, and it's an area that sounds a lot like science fiction. And it's an area uh, which sounds wild-eyed. Um, so let's pose it as a philosophical question. What if we could build smarter people. What would that mean? What would it do to society? What are all the implications of being able to artificially go in, not through a school system, uh, not through self-help, but literally using technology to jam things in your brain and make you smarter? And it turns out this is a field which exists called neuroprosthetics. And in fact, it's a, an emerging subfield of that called cognitive neuroprosthetics. Uh, and this broad idea that you could actually intervene and change someone's life should be very provocative, probably a little bit scary, but very likely within our lifetimes, this might well fundamentally change the definition of what it means to be human. And I'm going to explain why. I'm going to talk a little bit about these technologies, and I'm going to get into the messiness of it all. Uh, but when I, as I do that, uh, I want to focus on one thing. There's so many different things you could imagine you might want to change about yourself. Uh, we think about this and what I'm inflicting on you right now and how I might change it with some lipstick or some eye. Well, what if it was the deep and fundamental qualities of you? So let's focus on one, working memory span. So this is how many things you can keep in mind at any given time, how complex of an argument you can follow. Turns out the same neural systems subserve the richness of your imagination. Uh, the, there's so much about who you are that that one little concept encapsulates. In fact, it turns out uh, uh, kids that by the genetic lottery and the good fortune of their life have a slightly larger working memory span, they will live longer, they'll go further in their education, they'll earn more money, um, if you could go in and change that, you would. 
because I think that's what all of us try to do for our children, actively. Uh, so for 20 years, on my personal website, it has said, what if it was 20 plus or minus 2? Uh, so this is a reference to a very famous paper back in the 50s. It's a, called the Magic Number 7 plus or minus 2. It's a reference, I don't know, for some reason I want to jump off the stage at you guys. Um, it is a reference to uh, this concept of working memory span. It was one of the first big papers. And as I just said, uh, if seven's the average, if you're a nine, you've got a huge advantage. If you're a five, it doesn't mean you couldn't be a doctor. It doesn't mean you can't be a CEO. Apparently, you can be president. But <laughs> it, um, it presents a fundamental population-wide limitation on who you can become. Uh, there may be other issues uh, on the person I just referred to, but I can probably help with that also. So, um, we're working on technologies that can actively go in and change that number. And when I went around and interviewed for grad school, you know, I'd lean over to the person next to me and say, so what do you want to study? And they'd say, oh, this protein cascade and yeast. And I'd try to stifle my yawn. And then they'd say, what do you want to study? And I would say, cyborgs. And you could literally see them scoot away from me for fear that my crazy was communicable and they wouldn't get in. Um, but it turns out this is an amazing field. So one area I won't go into in a lot of detail are what are called motor neuroprosthetics. But I encourage you, after this, after the whole panel's over, go Google BrainGate, and you will see the most amazing videos. My favorite is a woman who is feeding herself for the first time. What is she doing? She has ALS. She's profoundly paralyzed, and she is imagining that she's moving her arm, and a robotic limb reaches out, picks up a thermos of coffee, and she takes a drink. And the most amazing thing about that video is that it's 10 years old. Uh, now, in the specific space that I'm talking about here, um, there are emerging technologies that are incredibly exciting. Uh, at UC Berkeley, where I'm coming from, we have a technology called neural dust, little nanomachines about the size of a nerve fiber. You can, somewhat metaphorically, imagine sprinkling thousands of these throughout your brain and being able to read out and write in, in detail, at a circuit level, what's going on inside the brain. What could you do with that? Well, we already know from lab work, I could pick up, there was a, there was a screen up here earlier about a technology at MIT for reading people's minds. It's a bit of a mischaracterization of what was going on, but in fact, you could pick up on all the subvocalizations through such a technology. You could uh, reconstruct the image that you're looking at. We could look at your decision process, your emotional state, and make all of that transparent and ready for you. Uh, this is pushing the envelope here, but imagine that you had a little app on your phone, and you could say, right now, I really want to be attentive, and I want to decrease the emotion. I want to be focused and, and analytical here, but later, uh, I'm going to go see the Avengers, and whenever who the hell gets killed, I know, I haven't seen it yet, don't tell me, uh, I want to feel it. I'm going to up the emotion, I'm going to push down the rationality, because it's a superhero movie, uh, and I'm going to go all in. And having that right in your hand, being able to redefine who you are at any given moment, is a phenomenal power. All right, so that's all hopes and dreams. So uh, I do a bunch of different things, and Paul referred to them. Uh, built a system for predict by, uh, manic episodes and bipolar sufferers, uh, just using passively using mobile phones. I built an AI to treat my son's diabetes. Uh, I built a system for Google Glass that could read facial expressions, write the emotion on the screen, so that autistic kids could learn how to read facial expressions. And it turns out, when they do, they learn empathy, uh, which means we're rewriting their brain. That's what education is. That's what life experience is, is changing your brain. Well, I have a couple of companies uh, working in this space. And the most exciting to me, to me right now uh, has invented a technology using what's called alternating current transcranial uh, stimulation. And this pairs, so you're wearing an EEG, brain waves, and it's paired with a stimulator. And what we're doing and this is very wonky, we're syncing up, as it's called coupling, 
that frontal gamma activity in your brain with posterior theta activity. And it turns out when you drive that, you increase working memory performance. And it turns out you increase it by about 15%. Now, that sounds very modest. If I had two populations of people, and you were all four-year-olds, and you all were the average working memory span, and you all had a 15% advantage. That roughly accounts for about a whole grade increased performance in school. That is 15 to 30% increase in lifetime earnings. Uh, that is almost certainly the difference between uh, a large population of early cognitive decline and never having experienced it. And in fact, there are interesting additional phenomenon. People with larger working memory spans have better eating behavior, better lifestyles, and they live longer. They are substantially healthier. That is a profound change for something which is essentially just a dumb hat you put on. Uh, and it stimulates you, and it pr produces this phenomenal effect. Uh, now, would this happen if I got everyone to wear the hat? We have no idea. I know when you're wearing it, your working memory is better. But when you take it off, are you better than where you started, or are you worse? And these are some of the big questions in this field. Uh, I don't know if we will ever have artificial general intelligence, AIs that are smarter than me. Maybe. But I can give you a timeline for a world in which there are people that are artificially smarter than other people. And so when I look at these technologies that I'm talking about, and they go so much more broadly than this, we're looking at technologies to allow locked-in people to be able to communicate with the outside world. They're locked into their bodies, and they can't otherwise do it. We're looking at the ability of taking whole teams and using neural feedback to drive their performance. Um, we are also looking at technologies that induce honesty by stimulating certain parts of the brain or create a perception of a positive experience in a neutral experience. Some of these are justifiably terrifying. And then you look at where the funding is coming from. And I don't say this with disdain. The very first project I ever worked on was real-time lie detection for the CIA. It was cool as hell, and it drives all the dumb cat animated videos on your iPhone 10 nowadays, because that lab spun off as a startup and got bought by Apple. Um, so I did, so much of what's good in the world has been funded for the purpose of understanding defense, uh, and I respect that. The other big funder in the world is in DARPA, is the Chinese military, and one other. There's a panel going on right now that turns out is the biggest private funder of this research, uh, professional e-gaming. It's a professional sport. Notoriously, professional athletes are interested in getting any advantage, even if it might damage themselves. Uh, and it turns out it's the same thing in the e-gaming community. They would love to take an advantage and trade a little bit of future cognitive capacity for a tiny 15% advantage right now so they can win those pots. This is what we're looking at. Uh, and I'm all out of time, so let me leave you with this because there's so many broader implications and details that we can get into in the panel. Um, in the next 10 to 20 years, these technologies might literally fundamentally change the definition of what it means to be human. For whom? For those people whose parents can afford them? Is it a sweet 16 gate gift for the elite? Or is it a human right? Uh, because I think we're looking at a near future in which one population of humanity is substantially different than another. And I don't know that that's recoverable. Everything you've ever been scared about, about AI, it goes double when we're talking about human beings. Uh, so let me put out this, and I'm going to make it broad. For all of the technology we've talked about and everything else you may have heard in this entire conference, technology should be challenging. Not only should we be better when we're using it, we should be better than when we started when we turn it off again. Uh, my work is about education. It's about people suffering major depression or with brain trauma. But someday, this will be about everybody's daily lives just as much as the smartphones are now. Uh, and I want to believe that is everybody's daily life, and it's making us better people. Thank you very much.
Amazing. I, yeah. Why don't, why don't we uh, why don't we invite uh, Hyunjun and Josh back up on stage and we'll take our seats and I'll ask you a question first, Vivian, as we uh, as we all take our seats. An amazing set of presentations there. Thanks to the three of you for for sharing your thoughts. Maybe Vivian, a question for you, just based on uh, what you just talked about. A lot of mind blowing ideas in there, so I think we uh, we hit the theme properly. Uh, what, what about the timing? So it, it, these are kind of a lot of experiments happening. What, what do you, where do you think we are on a timeline to have this be adopted in common practice treatments for autism and, and other diseases? So. Yeah, so you know, it's worth noting there are a number of neuroprosthetics that are out there in the world. Probably the most common is, is uh, uh, cochlear implants, and, and I once developed an algorithm for a cochlear implant that could hear, so you take people that are profoundly deaf and you wire essentially hearing aid directly into their brain, and they can hear again. Um, there are retinal implants uh, that are in human trials right now. I've already talked about the motor prosthetics. All of that's there. When we talk about cognitive and emotional neuroprosthetics, uh, there is even a, an example there, which is called deep brain stimulation, taking people with Parkinson's or severe depression and doing a certain kinds of stimulation of the vagus nerve and, and up into central parts of the brain that turns out to be, have big positive effects on them. When will we start to see the sorts of things I'm talking about? Well, you know, I've got three active companies in this space right now building product, uh, and um, there are no clear regulations around non-medical use of these technologies. So a lot of what's going on right now is not simply coming out of labs. It's just sort of biohackers that are going out there and experimenting on themselves to see what's possible. So as I look at a timeline, uh, over the next five years, I think we're going to see the first big impacts uh, of these technologies in certain specialized fields. E-gaming may well be one of them. The other one, I will just throw it out there, which I guarantee is what I call tyranny tech. Uh, if I can force people to be honest on stage, uh, if I can get them to love the speeches of their political leaders, why wouldn't I invest heavily in developing and distributing that as far and wide as possible? Right. Sounds like a Black Mirror episode. Okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, maybe just a question on transition, starting with, uh, with you, Hyunjin. It, it, I'll ask each of you kind of a related question on this, but these are very, very uh, I used the word disruptive early. These are all very disruptive, very, uh, you know, technology that are going to have a big impact. They're going to solve, you know, potentially solve big societal problems we don't otherwise know how to solve in some cases. At the same time, there's entrenched industries and entrenched ways of doing things. In your case, Hyunjin, we've got a silicon-based data industry, solid-state storage, all sorts of things. We, build, you know, we, we, we know how to build those systems a certain way. What do you think the transition looks like to DNA-based storage being adopted and you know, becoming more mainstream? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I think that we're not trying to replace the existing technology uh, from the get-go. Storage industry right now is uh, very much tiered. Um, all data centers have different tiers of storage. You have things that you have to retrieve very frequently in your Tadis tiers. And then you have colder tiers of storage where it might be printed out documents or magnetic tape stored off-site. I think that in the beginning, DNA could become something that supplements the coldest tiers of storage that plugs into the existing ecosystem and becomes an additional tier to the existing solution. Right, so it starts maybe as, a, as the uh, longer term, you know, cheaper storage. Okay. Right. And wh what about the, the issue of, uh, we didn't talk a lot about the issue of editing and writing the data. You talked about creating the, the storage. What, where are you in, on the challenge of, you know, kind of update? To the to DNA based storage, right? It, it's more of a warm drive. Read once, read uh, write once, read many times. Uh, but as we improve the technology, there could be ways for us to actually use enzymes to further modify the date or resequence data. or yeah, yeah, yeah. And things like CRISPR could be one way to address the data that's already been stored on DNA and edit it. Yeah, great. So it seems like you could mash up a couple of here. Here we have the experimental platform for driving computation you know, take a pill, have the robotic infrastructure with the closed loop drive through and figure out computation on whole genome-wide basis of, of someone's identity or whatever the computation might be, but in this sort of evolutionary experimental framework. Yeah, yeah exactly. But Josh, maybe comment on that. And then for, for you, so similar question of, uh, of the, the transition path. There's already, you gave examples of things that are happening now. What is that? look like in, you know, in terms of adoption? Where might it go, to, to Vivian's question? Um, 
So uh, let me start. I think we believe as a company pretty strongly that uh, the way to, for the stuff to, to be real is to do it in the context of a viable business that's creating value for customers and investors. Um, so we've been pretty uh, hopefully thoughtful about use cases to start with. We focus on things that are rapidly adopting. And so as I said, we expect to have product in, at scale in the markets 2020, maybe touch wood 2019. If any board members are in the room, it's not 2019, it's still 2020. <laughs> um, uh, but I think, I think by focusing on stuff that's rapidly adopting, and then you know, we, we expect, like in lots of these things, that there'll be some inflection point. I don't know when that's going to be. Um, but, but I think this is, this is here and now. Um, in terms of where could it go, sure, could you turn a cell into a computational device? Uh, yeah, there's enough complexity there. But I do think that for some of this um, mind-blowing technology that uh, impacts things that we don't think about in the real economy very often, uh, th it's easy to underestimate how much work goes into making this stuff economically viable, yeah. into working with an existing supply chain, existing value chain, dealing with competition, dealing with specs. Uh, all of these things are sort of boring, but they matter if you're trying to build a business. And I believe strongly this stuff's going to work when we build businesses that make it. So... Yeah, well, maybe just a follow-up on that. I, mean, if you th if, if, well, I may have a limited view on this, but if I think about the petroleum-based industries we have today, I mean, it's a very narrow set of the material on Earth we're using to, for a tremendous number of use cases. And what you're doing with the you know, microbes and, and the approach you're using, is we're opening up a vast, you know, vastly greater share of the Earth's material to engineer in ways to you know, create products for us. So maybe a comment from you. We, you talked about some examples. A lot of them are better, better ways of making things that we do today, better yep. plastic bottles and things. What, what are the frontiers of new things we, don't, we couldn't even conceive of making today that we may be able to make now? Um, I mean, I think, I think the things... So the first answer is... Uh, <laughs> it's obviously stuff we can't imagine, but what imagine, yeah. imagine things that are like stuff that's as hard as steel, but super porous and super flexible, right? Imagine things that uh, enable... Uh, really printable circuits and electronics that fade onto your skin so you can kind of wear a computer in a deeply fundamental way, but one that's got sensors embedded into it so it's interacting with the world and with other people around you. Um, imagine a pill that... Uh, Long-term drug dosage is a huge problem in treating, in treating folks, and adherence to medication is a big problem. So imagine a pill that's in a cage. You, uh, you, you swallow it. The heat causes the heat in your body causes the cage to gently constrict on a timeline and delivers an extended dose of the drug for a long period of time. I mean, I actually think that uh, the sort of things we can do is limited only by human creativity. Um, and for sure, we want to get as many people thinking about these things as possible. Yeah, now, there's a th common theme through, you know, through all of you talking, you know, d DNA and kind of using information in different, different ways, kind of what it means to be human. Uh, Vivian, the, maybe a question, question for you on this is we, you, you, you've referred to it in your talk about a lot of the conventional meme right now is, is AI and machines taking over the humans, and we talk about that. Your, your narrative is more about making superhumans and, and, it, and, and enhancing humans. It's almost a, it's, it's kind of a race that maybe converges at some point. Maybe to get you to talk about that a little bit, about how this plays out, and, um, and also maybe a little bit more. You started with the ethics at the very end, but what, where, where do you think we are in being able to deal with the, the ethics and implications? Yeah. Of you know, the, the, the thing that got me into the field of my work uh, right from the start is uh, this idea that human potential is something that we rarely uh, have the chance to live up to. And, you know, I mean that somewhat for everyone here in the room, but if you're growing up in a favela outside uh, Rio or in a village outside Dakar, you know, this is turned up to a, a phenomenal level. The, the chance, you, you know, one thing I'll guarantee is, is for someone in this room, uh, the child that will grow up to invent the cure for your child's fatal disease was just born in one of those places, and they will never have the chance to live the life that will lead to that cure. Uh, and to me, that's a human tragedy. And it's very motivating in the kind of work that I do. Um, so when I look at these sorts of issues, I try and put the ethical consideration contrasted against what I see out in the real world. We know with excruciating molecular detail how things like childhood household stress causally decreases working memory span, how social isolation in early life causally decreases uh, cognitive capacity. 
And in those stories, I'm talking potentially on the scale of hundreds of millions of people every year. Uh, and once you're about five to six years of age, these things are largely epigenetically set, and they never change after that. So the person that kid was born to be. So when I look at the ethics of these things as a yes or no question, I set it against that. And I say we actively, though unintentionally, do this to people all the time, uh, changing who they are. What if we could change, push back in the other direction? Having said that, though, uh, boy, the, the implications of having total control of yourself uh, is profound uh, and exciting. I mean, as a scientist, as a science fiction, as someone that wishes they could actually be a sci-fi writer uh, and instead is better at inventing the stuff, uh, I, you know, I, take these, I take it very seriously that when this plays out in the real world, I, I have a very provocative view on the world. I think most innovation actually um, fails uh, and often tends to make the world, uh, does the exact opposite of what we intend it to do. Uh, to understand how these systems work, you really have to understand the actual problem space. What does it mean to be human in the world? What is a change actually going to lead to something better? If all we think is, well, I've got a f uh, this hat, or maybe uh, what's called an invasive technology with one of these injectable technologies, uh, and I'm increasing my working memory span. In that case, I don't know what we're talking about. And I think it would be grossly unethical to release those sorts of things. So I'm here to invent it. I am not here to decide uh, how we deploy it. This is something we should do at least pluralistically, is make these decisions collectively. Because once I force it out there, uh, although I very much agree that for something to really change the world, it needs to be sustainable, and there's no uh, similar sustainability than having a true uh, uh, market solution out there. Uh, at the same time, uh, it shouldn't just be we've got a great transient business model, and we're going to go out and we're going to change the world. And I'll put it in the terms of a technology I know exists today as a neuroscientist. I predict in 20 or 30 years, we will see a significant increase in early onset dementia. Because we did something awful, evil, because we're thoughtless? No. It's because of automated mapping systems. We know that actively navigating through space is prophylactic against cognitive decline, and we don't do it anymore. I'm better when I use those maps. I am, and I use them all the time. Uh, but am I really better when I turned it off again? Yeah, no, that's uh, yeah, it's very interesting. The, the, uh, you know, and I'd like well, one point you made there, which is the bigger problems that, that these solve, and I'd just like to you know, comment that all of you are, you know, that there's, there's a business focus to all the, the ideas you have, but you think about the massive societal issues that seem intractable right now that could be solved, like one in your case, Josh, you know, the, the vast problem of ocean waste and plastics and things. You could see so, you know, some of these things being solved very simply almost in, you know, in terms of different materials and what, what you uh, produce, new forms of computing. You know, think about the data center storage that you talked about and reduced demand on the Earth's planet to store the information at scale and uh, human potential disease, uh, human uh, really being maximized. It's uh, really fascinating. So thanks for the work you do. It's been truly mind-blowing for me. I hope we've blown the minds of some of the audience here and that's uh, listening to this virtually as well. So with that, I'd like to thank the panel. Please join me in giving them a round of applause.